using it for the my gear. Deliberate. Maybe it's to try and get you into your lectures on time. Hey. Great stuff. Well, thanks a million, everybody. And um, as Lorraine said, um, I'm going to be really focusing in on pregnancy um, and nutrition. And so in terms of what I'm actually going to be sort of discussing here today, I think you can get a hint from the slide. I'm going to be going right the way through from that early preconception, first trimester, second trimester, then right the way through to having um, a baby in your arms. So in essence, I'm talking about that cycle of growth as you go right the way through. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare other than I've had two children and that in itself is a conflict of interest, but hey. Okay, so let's start before it starts. Um, Pre-pregnancy is a really important time to be thinking about nutrition and not a lot of people think about it as such. But really, when you think about any plant or living species, they need to be put into fertile soil to actually be able to thrive and grow. And so like that, the ingredients of what you add into the mix are equally important, especially when it comes to conception. So being a dietitian, um, I know none of us in this room eat nutrients. We eat foods. And so I'm going to try and make it as relatable as possible in terms of talking about foods in the context of healthy eating. So when it comes to healthy eating in Ireland, we have the healthy eating pyramid, although in essence it is missing the top part, so you don't eat all the way through the pyramid. I'm gonna start at the bottom, and this should be where we're focusing our attention, our energy, and most of your meals should contain a large amount of these foods. What are they? They're fruits, they're vegetables. You can see here that there are a variety of portion sizes. It depends on how sort of dilute the nutrients are in the case. So salad, you're talking about a medium bowl of salad being a serving, whereas orange juice, it's sort of two thirds of a glass. When it comes to fruit, it's kind of an easy one. I normally talk about what fits in the palm of your hand. So say a banana, an apple, 
six to eight strawberries and say eight to ten grapes depending on size. Um, when you go up again, you see that there's a nicely colored section which is what I would call the brown food section. And the reason I stress the fact that it's brown foods is brown is best when it comes to starchy foods. So if you're talking about breads, you're talking about whole grain, you're talking about whole wheat, rye, all of those would be better options than white bread. The same thing goes for cereal. You're talking about um, whole grain cereals such as porridge, um, your muesli's, um, Wheatabix, all bran, all those types of foods. They're inherently brown by color, and um, I try and tell my kids that the brown is, you know, the good stuff. Um, because sometimes when you look at brown, it can be a little bit bland to look at as a color. But definitely, brown is best. Same thing goes for rice and pasta, and then potatoes with the skins on if you can. Moving up then into milk, dairy uh, foods, and you're talking about a glass of milk. For a serve of cheese, it's an easy enough one. It's two thumbs of cheese. Um, now, some people have really large thumbs, so obviously um, use discretion, but in fairness, um, it's a generally a fairly good rule of thumb, like my pun there. Um, so in terms of meat and protein foods, the portions tend to be smaller than what we think about. Um, it's actually only half of the palm of your hand is a serve of meat. So it's not a full breast of chicken, particularly some of the XXL chickens. Uh, I'd hate to meet them on a dark night in an alleyway. Some of them just look like too big to be true, and they probably are. Um, but you're talking two eggs. You're talking about six tablespoons of beans, 100 grams of fish um, make up a serve. So two of those a day, three of dairy. And then up the top, you can see fats, oils, and spreads. So it's like mayonnaise about a teaspoon, same goes for oil, a pat of butter. The one that you'll see off the top is your sometimes foods. And it says clearly not every day. I know most people that I would have seen when I was in practice had what I would call an inverted triangle, where the most of their foods were coming from the not every day category. So I like to talk about these as my everyday foods and up the top as the sometimes foods, because you're not supposed to have them every day. And if you are having them every day, trying to cut them back is always a good start. So for me, in the preconception period, if somebody is eating towards this pattern of foods, then they're giving themselves a really nice start to that preconception period. In terms of fluid, you'll just see down the bottom that it's eight cups of fluid. That can include tea, coffee, etc. But water is obviously the best one in terms of just giving you instant hydration. And being physically active is really important. So that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm talking about healthy eating. And when it comes to any part of nutrition, you'll hear people talk about micronutrients and macronutrients. So your micronutrients are your vitamins and your minerals, and your macronutrients are your proteins, your carbohydrates, and your fats. And it really is important to think about the big picture. So your macronutrients are the most critical things to get right. And particularly when it comes to preconception, for both males and females, it is important to think about getting your weight balance right. So if a woman is underweight, she's actually going to be less fertile. So getting to a healthy body weight is important for a woman. If a woman has more weight than the normal range, which is worked out based on your weight over your height squared, it's called BMI or body mass index. So if you're not in weight balance and you have more weight gain than you have stability, what you will find is your fertility rates are also affected. So commonly in both males and females, one of the leading causes nowadays of infertility is actually carrying excess weight. So trying to get that big picture balance right is critically important for that preconception period. Other things to really think about in that preconception period, for both males and females, if you drink alcohol um, to either stop or reduce the amounts to a healthy, um, safe limit, I suppose is the best way to talk about it. When I talk about pregnancy for a female, um, the advice is no alcohol is safe in terms of threshold, that the alcohol should not be consumed in pregnancy. But in the pre-pregnancy period, the guidance is less clear. It is advisable to reduce. So for a female, it's 11 <coughs> standard drinks is the maximum that should be consumed in any one week. And no more than um, two, well, more than two alcohol-free days would be best. 
Um, and a standard drink is half a pint. It's a standard measure that you get in the pub of a spirit, and it's also a small glass of wine. So with alcohol, stop or cut down. With folic acid, it's really important to take folic acid when you're thinking about getting pregnant. Now, only one in two pregnancies is planned in Ireland, but that scale is inversely proportional to your age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have a planned pregnancy. So obviously, in the 16 to 18-year-old category, they tend to be unplanned pregnancies, whereas if you're talking mid-40s, they all tend to be planned. So that's the way the balance tends to go. But we say one in two. If you're thinking about getting pregnant, you may not actively be trying, but you think you might be something that you would consider. Taking folic acid now is probably a really important thing to do. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the first trimester, but I'll raise the point here. The other thing is about having that healthy, balanced diet. It will improve your fertility, and it will also help you grow a healthy baby and help your body overall. In terms of caffeine, if you drink a lot of caffeine, then it's advisable to try and cut down the amount of caffeinated drinks you consume. So I'll talk about caffeine in a second as well. And in terms of weight management, as I mentioned previously, trying to get in and around a healthy weight is a really positive start. And being active. If you are active, you are actually going to improve your fertility over the longer term. Um, and so that's why they advise being active. It also helps with weight management. So that's all about that kind of first preconception phase. What about the first trimester? So you've managed to get pregnant. Your baby, and I'm going to use the pictures of fruit. I don't know if you've seen those um, uh, slides where they start comparing the size of a baby to a fruit or a vegetable. I'm going to keep it to a minimum. We're going to go with one per trimester. In this case, you're looking at an apple. No, no prizes there, but the size of the baby is not the whole apple, because that would be kind of amazing. Um, it's actually the little apple seed. So at four weeks, the baby is about the size of an apple seed. So it's really quite teeny tiny. But the important thing in this first trimester is fueling a good start. And the reason being, if you can see here on the slide, you're talking about going from two cells to millions of cells as the baby progresses and grows. We know that when this tube here starts to form and close, it's a really critical stage of development. And as you can see here, that tube is starting to split and grow. It's drawn in here. And then once you get to about six to eight weeks, that tube is closed. That tube forms your neural tissue. So any of your nerves, your brain, your spinal cord, all come from that neural tube. If that doesn't close properly, you have huge impact on the development of the baby. So the idea is that we give the baby the best possible start in these early weeks before you really even know you're pregnant. Most women only find out they're pregnant around the six to eight weeks margin. And so taking something like, say, folic acid at that stage is actually a little bit too late because it's not going to have the impact that it needs to have on preventing those neural tube defects. So the advice is to take 400 micrograms of folic acid every day until you at least reach 12 weeks. You can continue taking it for the rest of your pregnancy. It's actually a useful vitamin to be taking in, but the idea is that you take it in the form of folic acid and not food folates. The reason being that important evidence actually out of Ireland showed that food folates alone will not enable you to reach the levels you need to reach in your blood. So you are encouraged to take folic acid. If you um, are on a medical card, you are eligible to get um, the supplement on the medical card in the preconception phase right the way through to week 12. Another supplement to take um, is vitamin D. And the reason you're advised to take vitamin D is that vitamin D goes hand in hand with calcium to make healthy bone structures. Obviously, um, it's Im an important vitamin but in Ireland, we don't get enough sunlight because of where Ireland's located. We're not on the equator. Um, and um, because of that, we need to get sources from food. So good sources are oily fish, such as sardines, mackerel, herring, salmon, and lake trout, and things like fortified milks. Um, the advice at present is for five micrograms of a supplement be taken daily during pregnancy. Um, uh, the guidance may change to 10 micrograms, but um, at the moment it's currently sitting at 5. Um, the UK is at 10. 
So um, that's part of the supplementation advice for pregnancy. And we actually advise babies to continue taking supplementation for the first year of life as well. So vitamin D is one of those things that you do need to take a supplement for in Ireland. The other substance that kind of, as I mentioned in the first slide when I was talking about the top tips for pre-pregnancy is caffeine. And we now know that taking anything more than 200 micrograms of caffeine per day in pregnancy results in increased risk of both miscarriage and stillbirth. So there are obviously complications that we want to avoid. So it means that you need to keep caffeinated beverages to a maximum of one to two a day. Uh, an easy way to reduce your intake of caffeine, and it's become a more doable thing since caffeinated beverages have kind of come into a bit of a spotlight, is things like your decaf. So decaf coffee is widely available now in most coffee shops, on the shelves of supermarkets, and the same can be said for decaffeinated tea. That's actually become much more widely available. So you can see both those can contribute a substantial amount of caffeine to a woman's diet. So if you can take the decaffeinated, then it's ideal to do so. Ones that people commonly miss are your um, minerals or your fizzy drinks. So any fruit flavored teas that are a soft drink actually have caffeine in them. Sometimes the diet versions of caffeinated or cola style ve beverages can have more than the original branded version. So you'll see there that Diet Coke has 20 more milligrams roughly than normal Coke of caffeine. So sometimes they add the caffeine to increase um, the impact of the beverage, I think is the term that's used. But it, 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 it creates a similar uh, feeling to the Coke with the sugar, is what I was told, is that you need a little bit more caffeine to keep it um, feeling um, like a proper drink. Um, if you drink, um, say, things like 7-Up, it doesn't have caffeine, but it does have added sugar. Um, and your energy drinks can be another one that some people don't realize actually has caffeine added to them. And some can have quite a substantial amount of caffeine added. And for those of you who like dark chocolate or chocolate itself, bear in mind that it does have small amounts of caffeine. So if you have somebody who eats a lot of dark chocolate, that is going to add up. Now, in fairness, it is a bar of dark chocolate and it tends to be a bit more satiating, but it is something to bear in mind. So caffeine keeping it to less than one to two drinks a day. So when it comes to foods, you might think, God, is there anything I'm allowed to have when you look at this slide? The thing to bear in mind is these are predominantly all sort of animal-based products. And because animal products have more of a food safety risk, that's why we tend to list them as being more foods that should be avoided in pregnancy. So you can see over in the top corner, there's um, your raw cured meat. So that's things like your parma ham, your salamis, they tend to be a risk um, for toxoplasmosis. The same goes with undercooked um, burgers um, at vans in uh, food fairs um, or um, sausages that have been undercooked at a barbecue need to be avoided in pregnancy. Unpasteurized milk, you might have thought that that's something that you really don't need to be concerned about in this day and age. It's actually becoming increasingly popular um, amongst a pregnant, a childbearing demographic. Um, so unpasteurized milks are widely available. They're not against the law to be sold. They're, they're, they're legally tendered. Um, so you need to be aware if you do purchase dairy products from, say, whole food stores, um, health food shops, farmers markets, that you do need to ask if you are pregnant, is this from an unpasteurized milk? Because chances are it could be. For vitamin A, um, you'll see there, liver is the main source of uh, vitamin A in a food concentrated source. Um, and that vitamin in high doses causes malformations in a baby. So the idea is that you try and keep your vitamin A amounts that you consume daily to uh, a lower amount. So liver contains too much for your body to be able to manage and that peak in vitamin A can cause damage to the baby. So you're best to avoid liver products such as pate, um, fish liver oils, and um, highly fortified foods. Pate also can have listeria, so for that reason, it's sort of a, a double no-no. 
um, and to be steered clear of. Um, and that does include sort of vegetable pâtés because I've had some people say, oh, but mine's a vegetarian pâté. It still is a risk because it's not usually a heated product, so there could be a contaminant there. In terms of cheeses, you'll see listeria is a main risk. Um, mold ripened cheeses, and those are your brie's, your camemberts. Um, soft blue vein cheeses are another one that potentially can have listeria, and also cheeses that are made from raw milk. So that's your unpasteurized milk. Listeria is a concern with things like ready meals. So when I say that, you know, some people don't buy ready meals in the shop but you might have um, a meal and you might keep some food to have the following day for your lunch or something. That's actually considered a ready meal, so you do need to be careful <coughs> about food preparation, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But when you're having a ready-cooked um, meal, it's things like soups, microwave dinners, um, you need to make sure that they're piping hot all the way through, particularly if you're heating it in, say, a microwave, cool spots, are still a risk point, so it needs to be piping hot all the way through. Eggs are a risk because they can potentially have salmonella, and so in the instance of somebody who likes um, some poached eggs with an avo on toast um, at the weekend when you're having your brunch, um, for me, having the uh, asking for the poached egg to be really well poached was kind of like a little dagger in my heart, but I did it anyway um, because of the risk um, that was posed. And finally, in terms of fish, you may have heard that mercury in pregnancy is not um, suitable to be consumed. So fish that contain mercury tend to be fish that are deep ocean fish. So you're talking your shark, your swordfish, your um, marlin. They're not commonly consumed here in Ireland, whereas when I was working in Australia, the Pacific Islander populations actually loved eating these foods. So it was something that I had to really go into detail about. But in Ireland, it's not a huge concern. Fresh tuna steaks would be the ones that um, tend to be our highest potential source here in Ireland. Um, the other advice around oily fish um, really contains the other oily fish. Um, in Ireland, the advice for tuna is no more than two eight-ounce cans in a week. So they're the little cans or one fresh steak in a week. Um, and the Irish advice is no more than two serves of fish in a week, one of which can be oily, and by that they're talking about the mackerel, the salmon, the herring, the trout, um, and one white fish, because white fish actually give you a really nice source of iodine, which is critically important for developing brain function in the baby, as is dairy. Um, so mercury is the main reason that those top fish are excluded and then raw shellfish is another potential food poisoning so your your oysters and um, kilpatrick etc are a no-no while pregnant unfortunately if that's something that you like so food safety is a key thing and um, for that reason we'd encourage women to make sure that they use plenty of soap and hot water when washing their hands in food preparation to make sure that if you are preparing meat or dairy and vegetables at the same time, that you try and use separate cooking surfaces, you know, chopping boards, separate utensils, or that you really clean the utensils in between use to try and stop cross-contamination. When cooking, that you're doing the food to a sufficient heated temperature so that they're getting cooked all the way through. And then if you are having leftovers for lunch, say, the next day, that you make sure that the food is transferred straight into the fridge so that you're cooling it down in a safe way. The other thing to bear in mind is if you do already have a child and um, they're going to childcare, etc., they can pick up a bug called um, CMV or cytomegalovirus from other kids. All it causes in toddlers, etc., is usually a runny nose, which you're usually cleaning up after. Um, so during that time, they'd advise you to wash your hands lots just in case you catch the CMV and you haven't been exposed to it before because it can cause miscarriage and stillbirth. And playing airplane food with your child, one for me, one for you, is also another way of getting the bug. So try and avoid that if you have a toddler. Plus, it's usually the food's fairly mundane. Um, so morning sickness is a big problem uh, in the first trimester. So making sure that if you are feeling morning sickness, and it can happen any time from morning to night, don't let people think you, you know, you're feeling sick in the evening. 
and um, some people feel more sick in the evening I know I was unwell with my second child all the way through the day it wasn't just morning it wasn't just evening it was pretty much consistent and the snacking on starchy foods tends to help so it's things like having dry crackers um, nearby if you have like little pieces of bread etc they can just help tide you over when you're feeling nauseous some moms find putting a pack of crackers beside the bed so that when they go to get up in the morning having a cracker actually before they get up tends to settle their stomach a little bit and they can get on with the rest of the day there is some low level evidence that vitamin b6 can be helpful um, and some people find it useful and if you are vomiting a lot, the advice is that you actually tell your doctor or your midwife because the nutrition you take in is also feeding your baby. So it is important that you try and manage the vomiting. So I want to stop and kind of ask people um, whether you think something is fact or fiction. So I'm going to say, I can't exercise in pregnancy, it's not safe. Who believes that statement is true? And you can just raise your hand. So true or false? Okay, good job, good job. Yes, it's not true. Um, you'd be surprised the amount of people that say, oh, I can't exercise, I'm pregnant. It's actually beneficial for you to exercise while you're pregnant. Um, we know that women who are physically active are a third less likely to have a cesarean section. And for most women, that's something that they would do best to avoid because it's surgery um, and you have recovery time and also a baby at the same time. So you can't really chill out and recover. Um, so if you are active, um, continue to do so. I'm sure some of you have seen some amazing pictures of high-level athletes that have become pregnant and are still running things like marathons into their third trimester. It's, it's amazing how their bodies keep adapting to pregnancy. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you are physically inactive, you start running marathons while you're pregnant, plus you'd be looking at me like I was mental. But if you are new to exercise, something like walking is a great start or swimming. And the only provisos that you need to take into account is not exercising in hot conditions um, because your body is not as good at regulating your temperature while you're pregnant at extremes and then avoiding contact sports for the obvious reason that it could potentially damage the baby. So top tips for your first trimester are to have regular meals every day to try and avoid your sometimes foods if you can. Take your folic acid and your vitamin D every day. Try and start, try starchy snacks if you are feeling sick due to morning sickness. Drinking plenty of water and trying to keep your drinks of caffeine related drinks down to one or two a day. Avoiding alcohol and that same thing is going to be said through the whole of pregnancy and unsafe foods and try and follow food safety guidelines. So we've moved from first trimester to our second trimester and at the start of which your baby is about the size of a nectarine and then when you hit third trimester we've moved into vegetables. So uh, we're talking uh, a nice cauliflower head um, and I don't doubt that you, you start to notice that things are changing by the time you're going through these trimesters. So it's definitely a growing baby and a growing mother. Now a lot of women are really surprised when they see this kind of graph because to me it speaks a lot to people saying oh it's all baby weight um, in fact the baby is only a quarter of the weight you gain in pregnancy so about 3.5 kilos of the 13 or so kilos you gain is going to be your baby all the rest is the machinery that powers you being able to grow that baby so it's things like your blood volume getting larger you're going to put in stores so that you can actually feed the growing baby. Um, you're going to put on weight in breast tissue. Um, the placenta will take up some of the weight, etc. So I'm going to lead on to my next fact or fiction. What do we think? The phrase I'm eating for two, is it true? Hands up. False. I have a very, very good audience. What can I say? Um, so the the, the common misconception that is still out there, believe it or not, is around the fact that you need to eat for two, when in fact, the actual amount you need to gain depends on what your weight is before you got pregnant. So say, for example, you were underweight before you got pregnant, you actually need to eat and gain more weight than somebody in that normal weight category, because the idea is you need to build those stores that I just showed you in the previous graph. 
if you're a normal weight, the average weight gain is about 11 and a half to about 16 kilograms. Overweight or obese category individuals will need to gain less weight because they already have sufficient stores. And your weight gain is predominantly in your second and third trimesters. Most women will gain about 500 grams in a week um, over the course of those two trimesters. You only gain about 5% of your weight in that first trimester. And for the weight gain, you need to take in about 200 extra calories in your second trimester and about 500 calories in your third trimester, according to sort of EU guidelines. So what we start advising women to do in the second and third trimester is to think about incorporating roughly 100 kilocalorie nutritious snacks during the day. They can be at the meals, they can be in between meals, but really trying to get the energy in along with a lot of those nutrients. So things like a slice of fruit loaf, two oat biscuits, some dried apricots, a piece of fruit, a glass of milk. Um, if you're hitting your three serves of dairy a day, you're going a lot of the way towards getting enough iodine. If you add in an additional um, dairy snack, you will actually get up to your 200 um, milligrams of iodine that you micrograms of iodine that you need in the day. So um, dairy is a really nice source of iodine. Um, and as I said previously, iodine is important to help your baby grow. One of my favorite snacks when I was pregnant was sticking on um, a mushed banana, some people think it's gross, on top of my fruit toast, so I was there going, solid, 200 kilocalories. So I used to count, you know, kind of having one of those a day alongside other snacks as my way of making sure I was kind of meeting what I needed in terms of my targets. So things that can make your life easier in terms of getting nutrition in as well as energy is swapping one for another. So in this case, it's instead of fruit juices, trying to choose fresh fruit, instead of your um, beverages being um, of the sugar sweetened variety, trying to choose water or milk, instead of biscuits, choosing fruit as a snack, instead of white bread, going for whole grain, whole meal um, varieties, or even the high, high fiber white breads are a better alternative. Instead of sugar sweetened cereals, going for things like porridge, you can even get in an additional good thing by adding in some chopped fruit or some dried fruit when you're making your porridge. Um, my daughter's particular favorite is uh, chopped dates mixed through and she says it's absolutely delicious. Um, in terms of fried foods, once they're fried and coated in a batter, you've added in lots of extra fat, lots of extra salt, which are off the top of that um, food pyramid. So best to use fresh cuts of meat um, and to prepare them fairly simply. Chips are another one. If you eat the potato in place of the chips, um, you can actually get much more fiber and much less fat and salt. And when you're out and about eating in a restaurant, try and avoid the creamy based sauces and go for the more tomato based sauces. It doesn't mean you can't eat out, but you are making a better choice if you go for those more tomato based alternatives. I'm going to talk about a few of the side effects of pregnancy. Um, so um, constipation is a really common complaint that women face in pregnancy, particularly as the pregnancy advances. Um, and it's mainly to do with the hormones that encourage your bowel to stay nice and still, which is not anybody's friend. Um, so the idea here is to try and incorporate things like fruits and vegetables and water as snacks or additional bits in your meals because what will happen is the water will help soften your stools and the fruits and the veggies will also help soften them down. So it'll mean that the constipation is lessened through making these small changes to the types of things you're choosing at your meals and snacks. Another key complaint that women have in pregnancy is heartburn, particularly as the baby gets larger, it's pushing more and more on your stomach, which causes acid reflux, which is what heartburn is. Um, so some women notice particular foods set them off. Um, and so if you are somebody who notices that there's a relationship between say spicy foods and your heartburn, well, the best thing to do is avoid it for a couple of weeks because what you'll find is that your heartburn lessens and you're more happier in yourself. Other things that can work are eating smaller meals more frequently. So rather than having three big meals, try and have five to six small ones. Um, it, 
sitting up straight while eating it might sound funny but the more pregnant you are the more you sit back and the baby's weight pushes more on your stomach so trying to encourage the mom to sit up as much as possible while eating trying to not eat three hours before bedtime and um, some women find drinking milk helps their heartburn it's not necessarily evidence-based but for some people it works and if they do some of them find keeping it by their bedside when they feel particularly unwell might help propping your head up a little bit with pillows can help keep the stomach down a little bit further although that's kind of difficult in your third trimester where you're lying on your side anyway so you're going to be uncomfortable no matter what so um, I think if you can prop yourself up in bed a little bit that might work and if you ask your GP or your midwife you can get advice around what are the best antacids or um, algates to take to reduce some of the symptoms anemia is the other really common side effect of pregnancy um, the reason being that you're commonly expanding all of your blood supply to feed your, yourself and your baby and so you need a little bit more iron as a result we tend to find women do get anemic in their second and third trimesters particularly animal sources of iron are really good sources of iron if you eat meat um, so any animal sources are called heme iron um, the non heme iron um, are covered in more your dark green leafy vegetables and your beans the only downside to the non heme iron is they're a little bit less well absorbed and so they really benefit from having a rich vitamin C source uh, present while you're actually consuming them and even the heme sources benefit from having them around so things like having orange juice with a fortified cereal improves the absorption of the iron in that meal things like adding fruit to meals that or having them near when you have a meal as a snack um, or adding things like a tomato sauce to your mince is going to improve the um, absorption of the iron taking tea close to a meal and um, will decrease the absorption of iron so the tannins in tea will reduce it the tannins will still be present in your decaffeinated tea so if you are drinking decaf tea even then you still need to keep a bit of a break between your meal and when you're having your cup of tea and finally if you are on an iron tablet it's important to take it on an empty stomach or at least one hour before your meal so that you've got a chance to digest the iron without anything else interfering with it and you need to continue taking it for at least six weeks after your baby is born and the reason being that we lose a lot of blood when we deliver a baby and it's best to replete it as soon as possible after you give birth and finally around activity um, it's really important that you stay active I know in first trimester we've all got the best will in the world and as you get bigger and heavier you tend to think ah, I'll give it a rest but they actually show that if you keep active the women actually report feeling better in themselves over the course of pregnancy so it's, it helps improve your mental health um, and um, levels of tiredness reported are also decreased the only thing to bear in mind in trimester two is that if you are doing any abdominal work where you're lying on your back you should really try and avoid it because the weight of the baby starts to push on some blood vessels and you will reduce blood flow to both yourself you'll start feeling a bit nasty but also the baby will have slightly reduced blood flow so it's not ideal so lying on your side is fine but just not on your back and then in trimester three most women start finding most activity a little bit more challenging so things like gentle swimming or walking can be a great alternative to keep going other women tend to find that cycling or rowing in the gym is still something that's achievable if you can reach the bar um, and um, it's much safer than actually trying to do cycling um, on a bike outside because your center of gravity is off once you hit third trimester and um, it's not safe to be cycling um, after kind of that stage um, and you need to just listen to your body while you're exercising if you feel uncomfortable there's no harm in stopping because you're actually going to be listening to what's happening and always drinking plenty of water so my top tips for your second and third trimesters are having regular meals with regular healthy snacks so making sure you're including those snacks because you do need them cutting down on sometimes foods because you want each snack to be as nutritious as possible drinking plenty of water limiting caffeine again and the same goes for alcohol and trying to choose safe foods so not hugely different but just reinforcing the fact that you do need to have those healthy snacks okay last bit 
37 weeks, your baby's about the size of a pumpkin. Nobody likes to think of it that way because you're like, that has to come out. Um, but um, the thing that you need to think about at this stage is really just getting the baby off to a good start now that you've grown them really well and healthily. Um, you're thinking about beyond baby. So fact or fiction again, drinking castor oil can bring on labor. Do we have any believers? No? You're right. <laughs> don't do it. Really, don't do it. Um, my friend is a doctor, and she gave it a whack because she was just so sick of being pregnant. And she was like, I felt so sick. I know I tell all my patients never to do it, but I did it myself, and it was a bad idea. So it's really a bad idea. It's not evidence-based. It makes no difference. It gives you diarrhea, and you want to vomit. It's nobody's friend. Um, what is out there in terms of limited evidence is eating dates, believe it or not. So you need to eat six dates a day from 36 weeks, and that's the, the evidence is loose. Don't get me wrong, it's not ironclad. Um, you're more likely. But then again, most women say after two days of eating six dates a day, they feel sick anyway, so they just don't want to do it. So adherence is poor. The other one that has evidence but again, things to think about is raspberry leaf tea. So starting that at 32 weeks, one cup a day and building up to three cups a day, and not starting it at 36 weeks because it's actually um, proven to be actually damaging to the baby and to you. Um, but you absolutely, this is one that you do need to be doing under supervision of your carer because there are certain women who cannot take it. It causes very negative side effects for the mum. So it's not safe for everyone. And the ones that you will hear about are the spicy curry. So the spicy curry um, has very poor evidence behind it. The only thing that it's linked to is that it will stimulate your gut. Um, <laughs> so um, we know that at the time of stimulation of labor, a woman's gut gets stimulated. So they think that if you do one, you're going to get the other. However, we know it's the baby that stimulates the labor, not your gut. So in fairness, if you like a curry, have a curry. I'm not saying don't have a curry if you're pregnant, but um, it's not going to start labor. And then finally, there is some animal evidence around eating pineapple, but the level that was done in these studies was astronomical. You would need to be eating pineapple morning, noon, and night to be getting the amount of bromelain that's in the pineapple that would actually soften your cervix. So I don't rate it because eating a lot of pineapple is very acidic and your mouth will be full of ulcers <laughs> before you know it. So, and finally, You've got the baby. You've gone through the whole process. On cue. Um, um, so the idea thing is with breastfeeding, um, it's the best thing for your baby. Um, skin to skin contact is the best thing to have happen post delivery. So within the first hour, it's called the golden hour, you should aim to have the baby on your chest. If it can't be on your chest, then on your partner's because the baby's sense of smell is highly acute. A newborn can smell their parent from the other side of a room. They couldn't see beyond this far of their face, but their sense of smell is what actually allows them to survive. So putting them to the chest allows them, if you let them, they will wriggle their way down towards your chest. It's amazing the power of that sense of smell. They know where to go. Once they're alert enough, trying to offer them a feed, um, looking for signs of hunger. Um, one of the key things I would say to people is crying is the last on the list that's the baby angry because uh, it's got no food look for signs where it's touching its face it's wriggling around a little bit more you will become the interpreter of your baby over time um, but the key thing is trying to allow the baby to feed as often as it needs particularly during those early days having the baby close by allows you to do that you spend the time with the baby you, you, you can become a little bit more comfortable and don't be afraid to ask for help everybody has to learn how to breastfeed. It's, while it's natural, it's not easy. So seek support is what I would say to you. So I'm gonna finish off by reinforcing my whole thing, which is if you can get the balance right, all the rest of the things in terms of pregnancy fall into place, both pre, during, and after. Keeping fruit and vegetables to the bottom, the thing you eat the most of is crucial. The same with choosing the brown foods, making sure you're having good amounts of dairy, keeping protein to twice a day, and then limiting the other things. And if you can do that, you are absolutely going to be on the right track to success. So 
I'd like to close by saying if you are interested in learning a bit more, there are really good resources on the mychild.ie. The breastfeeding.ie site is going to move into that mychild.ie, but at the moment you can still access it um, through that website. And if you're interested in the food safety and the guidelines end of things, there's safefood.ie, fsai.ie, and an organization in the UK that's about advocacy around pregnancy and maternal health is Tommy's, and some people find the information presented there to be really quite user-friendly. Um, most women should get this booklet at the start of their pregnancy if they're going through a HSC service, and hopefully that will also help support you in choosing the right foods for pregnancy. So I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and your attention. I know. <laughs> I suppose in pregnancy there's a difference between cravings and kind of the PK, which are what maybe some people hear about, you know, people eating unedible foodstuffs. And when somebody has a strong craving for something that you wouldn't normally eat, the common one that I would have heard about, now I've never had anybody say they wanted to eat it, but it was coal. When people used to have coal in their house, the women used to say, oh, I'm just dying for a piece of coal. Um, they tend to be indicators of micronutrient deficiencies, in particular anemia. So if you start having really unusual cravings, um, it can be a sign that you might need to have your bloods done to check that you're anemic. And choosing, obviously, edible sources of iron are a much better way of getting iron into your body than having an old chew on coal. Um, but generally, the cravings, yeah. Um, and having regular healthy snacks can tend to a less than those as well. It, it might be just another way of interpreting the body being seeking nutrition. No, I mean, the guidance isn't there anymore that you should avoid nuts um, unless you have an allergy that requires you to avoid nuts. Having nuts in pregnancy actually potentially is a positive thing um, to help expose um, your immune system to nuts while experiencing pregnancy. There's no proof that you having nuts in pregnancy causes any issues with your child. Um, so, yeah, if you eat nuts regularly, then having a handful of nuts is the equivalent of a protein serve, and it's a good snack to have. You know, if you have a handful of almonds, that's um, a serve of calcium. So, yeah. I suppose first line is dietary when it comes to gestational diabetes. So we would encourage women to have a look and see um, how they're managing if they're diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So what that is is you develop a diabetes that happens only in pregnancy. Um, and so they will do a blood test to check if you're in the range that diagnoses it. And if you're in that, the initial guidance, unless your values are very, very high at the start, is to try diet initially. And they'll normally give a woman a week to two weeks to see how her blood sugars are looking. And if they're still looking very high, what they will do is they will start treatment. So it might be metformin if she'll take a tablet or it might be insulin. Um, we know that some women do better um, if they have a history of other health concerns, monitoring their bloods much more closely and potentially starting treatment with insulin earlier. But food-wise, 
um, it really is about restricting carbohydrate and keeping blood sugars down. That's the critical thing because out of all the things we can expose a baby to, it turns out that glucose is the most damaging at high levels to babies. Um, so we really do need to get those blood sugars down. But it can be things like after a mum has her meal, making her get up and go out for a walk because we know that will help drop her blood sugars. And it's amazing the amount of people that I would see that go out and do a 30 minute walk after they've had their dinner that come back and say, geez, my blood sugars were amazing. I was under for the first time ever um, after having a walk. But it can be very challenging for some women to restrict their carbohydrates. So I, it's choosing other nutritious sources of say, um, you know, healthy fats and trying to spread the carbohydrate through the meals um, so that you can balance both the insulin and the carbohydrate is, is the challenge. Thank you.